Shalom and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this program today, we'll be making the historic and legal case for the modern state of Israel. Warm welcome to the program, and uh, it's with great pleasure that I can introduce today's guest, who is uh, Hugh Kitson, and he's a doctory documentary filmmaker. Hugh, welcome to the Middle East Report. Thank you for the welcome. And uh, you've been on before, so I don't need to uh, ha have your testimony, but you know, y you deserve a lot of credit and I think a lot of admiration for what you've pioneered um, in terms of the Hatikva films. Uh, the Forsaken Promise, and a whole series of films that so many of our viewers are very fond of, uh, and they've had such a profound impact in bringing the word of God alive through documentaries, particularly concerning Israel and the Jewish people. And of course, many of those uh, films starred the late uh, Lance Lambert, incredible Bible teacher. Um, what is it like to, to make one of those documentaries and to know that those documentaries have had a big impact on so many Christians throughout the world? Well, I think first of all, um, the glory has to go to God because it was he who who gave me the calling in the first place. And um, I first received the calling, actually, when I was in my 20s. And um, I, I actually trained, uh, did my training in the film and television industry 50 years ago now, uh, 1967, I was in film school. But the, the glory must go to God. The, the, the calling came very early in my life. But um, for one reason or another, the Lord um, didn't enable me to enter into that calling until really the late 1990s and um, he's, he's truly enabled me to do what he's called me to do in a, in a wonderful way. Fantastic uh, and, uh, and I think it's so important that uh, you know these are films that have made a big difference. Uh, what is it like when you work with or worked with sorry uh, people like uh, Lance Lember who Sadly, he's not with us anymore, but he's in a much better place in heaven. Um, absolutely. Well, Lance was a real mentor to me. Um, it wasn't just a question of um, us working together on, on the films, but um, uh, he was a spiritual mentor to me. I first met him in, in 1991, and um, the first film that I did with him was Jerusalem, the Covenant City, which is a documentary that looks at the prophetic destiny of, of Jerusalem. And um, it's, Jerusalem is probably the only city in the world that has basically had its history written in advance. But um, to work with Lance on that was, was tremendous. He, he taught me a lot, and a lot of what I've learned about Israel over the years, um, and especially the spiritual aspect, has, has come from Lance. So, for me to work with him was, was a tremendous privilege. Fantastic. Now, we're here today to uh, talk about your new film, and uh, we'll have, uh, this is it, called Whose Land? And um, thankfully, Hugh, you gave me the opportunity, uh, I think back in June, to interview uh, Colonel Richard Kemp, and we discussed a little bit about the film, because I think you were just tying the loose ends to this new mm. documentary, um, in which stars Colonel Richard Kemp. Kemp talking about the historical and legal foundations for the modern state of Israel. Um, can you share with us why you made the film and why did you choose its title, uh, Whose Land? Well, Whose Land uh, is the first film I've made about Israel that is actually aimed at a secular, general secular audience rather than uh, a specifically a Christian audience. And um, I, I first had the inspiration to do this film some 25 years ago. In fact, back in 1992, uh, I um, read a book by a man called Murray Dixon, Reverend Murray Dixon, 
called Who's Promised Land? And that is not to be confused with another book of the same title uh, written by Colin Chapman. Um, I believe he's a mentor to Stephen Sizer to some degree anyway. But Murray's book was an educational book being used in schools. And in a very concise way, they put the historical facts concerning the rebirth of the modern state of Israel, really going back to the mid-19th century. And that book was really the inspiration for this. And in 1992, I actually wrote an outline for the film that is now today. <clears throat> it was looking more at the historical aspect, because in those days, uh, well, first of all, I didn't have th uh, an understanding of the legal aspect. But what has come forth in more recent years, especially concerning the San Remo resolution, was pretty unknown in those days. And one of the reasons for that was that these documents were buried deep in the National Archives in Kew. And it was a lawyer called Howard Grief who unearthed all of this and a better understanding of the legal foundations of the State of Israel going back to 1920 came forth. So anyway, I wrote the original um, treatment, if you like, back in 1992 on an old fashioned typewriter. I never even switched on a computer at that time. And um, it stayed in a filing cabinet for the next um, 18 years. And it was only when uh, the first San Remo conference held by the European Coalition uh, for Israel back in 2010, the 90th anniversary of the, re of the original um, San Remo conference, that the legal significance um, began to uh, come forth. And I got this thing out of the filing cabinet, uh, had a look at it, and much to my surprise, the basic issues hadn't changed. Uh, they were just now very much more intense than they were back in 1992, pre the Oslo Accords. Let's have a look now at uh, the trailer for uh, Hugh's new film called Who's Land? Whose Land is a documentary film looking at the legitimacy of Israel in international law with a highly qualified group of historians and international lawyers. San Remo, the Villa de Vacha. This is a place where legal rights were given to both the Jewish people and the Arab people. It was the Jewish people that were chosen to be the beneficiaries of a trust, a mandate under the care of the British government in respect to Palestine. San Remo basically adopted the content of the Balfour Declaration and it was approved by 51 countries, which was then the international community. The international law that governs the settlements relies on the San Remo Conference. That is the basis. That's not been changed. The San Remo Resolution of 1920, its unanimous endorsement by the League of Nations, and the mandate document which incorporated the Balfour Declaration is binding under international law to this day. In formulating legally binding instruments, there was a recognition of the cultural, historic roots of the Jewish people in that land. You see they are recognizing a pre-existing right and not creating a new right. In other words, the historical rights of the Jewish people to this land were recognized by the great powers at the time, by the equivalent of the UN at the time. Which means that if they can establish that they had a vibrant community in, in Jerusalem, in Hebron, or in Shiloh, and in, in different areas of the Holy Land, they've been given the right to reconstitute these communities. Article 80 of the UN Charter assumes the powers that were given to the League of Nations so that anything that was decided under the League of Nations, such as the San Remo Resolution, such as the Mandate for Palestine, are still legally binding under the UN Charter. It becomes part of international law. 
At the same time, we will reveal that the Palestinian claim to any part of the land has no historical basis at all. Of course, there was no Palestinian nation. Salah Adin, neither Dar el Omar had in mind building an Arab Palestinian nation as they write today in their history. Nobody had any thoughts of Palestinian nationalism at that time, whatever, um, because there was no such place as the state of Palestine and never had been. So nobody had gone for generations thinking, I'm a Palestinian. So the name Palestine after 1948 was kind of adopted by the non-Jewish Palestinians and they say, we are the true Palestinians. We belong in the land. We are the indigenous people. And these Jews came in later and created this colonial thing called Israel. The Palestinian Authority tells their people that uh, the Jewish people did not have a history in the land of Israel. Uh, and this is one of their fundamental principles of their ideology. Uh, and therefore they claim that there never was a Jewish presence in Jerusalem. An UNESCO resolution that basically says that Jews and Israel do not have any connection to Jerusalem and the Temple Mount is something that should stay in history as the biggest, the biggest lie whose land does not set out to justify the right of Israel to exist. Instead, it simply tells the truth. The attempt of the modern Palestinians to say, oh, we go back to antiquity, there always were Palestinians here, is rubbish in historical terms. Media coverage of the Middle East and even United Nations resolutions use terminology such as occupied Palestinian territory and the illegal occupation. Is this terminology based on international law or is it simply anti-Israel propaganda? The term Palestinian territories, or occupied Palestinian territories, or OPT, which is used in virtually every General Assembly resolution in the UN, this expression has got absolutely no basis whatsoever. It's, it's, it's utter nonsense. The Arab rejection of Resolution 181 precludes uh, the Arabs from any legal claim they might otherwise have to that territory. Jordan, Syria, Egypt had n no claim to Jerusalem or the West Bank on the basis of any do doctrinal principle of international law. And so the Jewish settlements and the claim for Israel to exercise jurisdiction uh, over the West Bank, I think is legally, legally supported, certainly by Article 80 of the UN Charter. We don't discuss the borders anymore of Iraq or Syria because those borders were established under international law. The same thing applies to Israel. The United Nations does not determine borders. Resolution 2334 would be in breach of Article 80 of the UN Charter if it were enforceable, but it's not enforceable. Join me, Richard Kemp, in the two-part documentary film Whose Land? as we uncover the true story behind the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So if you really want to gain a real understanding of the historic and legal basis for the uh, Jewish State of Israel, then I can't recommend uh, whose land enough. Um, you've done a great job with this uh, documentary, Hugh, you. in terms of really grasping the historical and legal um, pointers regarding the re-establishment of the State of Israel and the, uh, you know, you have uh, profound experts in their field who you interview and of course uh, Colonel Richard Kemp does a fantastic job mm. in uh, narrating the story. What was it like working with someone like Colonel Richard Kemp who, who has such an distinguished military career. I mean, he was the head of British uh, intelligence in Afghanistan. He's, um, he's He's chaired COBRA meetings in 10 Downing Street, and, and now he's one of Israel's most passionate uh, spokesmen. And uh, you've got him working for you. 
Well, it's a great privilege to to have worked with him because uh, he and I actually do share the same passion. And uh, uh, he, he stands up for Israel quite simply because he's fed up with seeing uh, Israel slandered and pilloried and lied about in the media. And um, I think he is a tremendous friend of Israel, but he was absolutely wonderful to work with. And um, it really was a great privilege to have him on board. Um, you probably saw him say at the end of that preview there that it's a two-part documentary. Well, uh, we have just released just part one at this stage, which takes us up to Israel's independence in 1948. Uh, part two will start off where part one finishes and will bring us right up to the present day. Um, you know, Joseph Goebbels, who was um, Hitler's architect to denounce the Jewish people and to declare them as, as subhuman, he was Hitler's chief propagandist, once said that if a lie is repeated often enough, then the people will believe it. And um, this really is at the heart of whose land. There has been so much misinformation uh, in, in the media generally, but the, um, the, the Palestinian propaganda, and okay, credit to them in one sense, that um, they have been so successful in, in telling these lies, uh, denying Israel's historic presence in Jerusalem in particular and, and the land of Israel, they've been so successful in doing it that many people in the West now actually believe this. Um, and there is absolutely no historic basis for a Palestinian people, as you saw in that preview. So really, as Richard Kemp said in that uh, preview, we're about telling the truth. Absolutely. And it's also uh, very, very timely that you've now uh, released the uh, DVD for general release, primarily because it coincides with the 100th anniversary of the signing of the Balfour Declaration and really does explain why the British government uh, decided to endorse the Balfour Declaration and how significant that was for the re-establishment of the Jewish state in the heart of the Middle East. Well, I was very interested to see what Simon Johnson had to say last week on the Middle East Report, because um, one of the things that we do in this is to go into the Balfour Declaration in quite some detail, because as, as he said, it was almost, it's like the birth certificate for the modern state of Israel. Now, the Balfour Declaration in legal terms was nothing more than a letter of intent, and it was actually the San Remo resolution and the mandate document that followed that that effectively raised the uh, thing that had been the letter of intent to the level of an international treaty which is binding under international law. And so that is the very foundation of Israel's legitimacy in international law. And it may s surprise you to know that actually, in one sense, Israel in international law possibly has more legitimacy than any other nation on the face of the earth. And if I can just make a remark about that, which is not in the film, we can't, we don't say it in the film because we're, we're targeting primarily a secular audience. Our prime target audience is political leaders, academics, media, as well as the general public. I think it's the media we're going to have the toughest time with. Um, but it's almost as if God, well, God did give the title deed to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants as an everlasting possession 4,000 years ago. And that title deed is in the Hebrew scriptures, the Tanakh, uh, and the Old Testament, and even alluded to in, in the New Testament. But what God did, and I believe he did it sort of under the table, as it were, in 1920, is he enshrined that title deed that he given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob into international law in the modern era. 
And I believe that this is actually a spiritual battle as much as anything. And that is why the legitimacy of Israel is under such attack these days. Uh, everything is being done to try and undermine the Jewish state through either demonization, accusations of apartheid, um, and so on. And there are so many people who say that um, uh, Israel has no legitimacy in international law. That's rubbish, actually. And uh, there is a battle, uh, as you uh, rightly say, Hugh, for uh, the very existence of the Jewish state of Israel. And, and no other nation has its own sovereignty questioned like the nation of Israel. Uh, why do you think this is? Because if you look at the, the, the rest of the Middle East, it's pretty much drawn up by the British and the French colonials after the uh, First World War. So why can't other people turn around and say, well, what legitimacy does Jordan have? What legitimacy does Lebanon have, or Syria have, or Iraq have? Uh, and why is it always that Israel is in the spotlight, and Israel is be her very legitimacy as a nation state is constantly questioned in world public opinion, but also in academia as well? Well, I think our Christian audience here uh, would probably understand the answer to this question, the answer I'm about to give to this question better than most, and of course we don't cover this in, um, in whose land, but it actually has to do with the days in which we're living, and as Christians believe, the return of the Lord Jesus, and uh, to, to take up the throne of David in Jerusalem, and this actually is the seat of the throne of David in Jerusalem, and there, there are plenty of um, of uh, scriptures in the Tanakh that talk about this, but also even in the New Testament, when the angel Gabriel came to visit uh, Mary and predicted that she would um, carry a child conceived by the Holy Spirit, uh, he went on to say that um, he will be called the Son of the Most High God, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and that he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. That's in Luke mm. chapter 1, verses uh, 30 to 33. And so there in the New Testament, you have the prediction, which has never yet been fulfilled. Yes, he was born uh, of, uh, of the Holy Spirit. Um, so that part of it's been fulfilled. But the Lord Jesus has never yet ruled over the house of Jacob, even though the people of his day recognized him as the son of David, um, he has never yet ruled over the house of Jacob. So this has yet to be fulfilled. And I right. believe that this is at the very heart of the battle mm. for the nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem today, <laughs> because Jesus is not going to return to Jerusalem as the capital of a Palestinian Islamic state. Jerusalem needs to be under Jewish sovereignty. And this is why you have this very intense battle. Um, and so many lies are being told about the legal situation in international law. Should we uh, take a look, uh, Hugh, at um, an extract from uh, Hugh's new film called Whose Land, talking about the importance of the signing of the Balfour Declaration. In late 1916, the Allied forces, known as the Egyptian Expeditionary Force, were nearing El Arish and the border with Palestine, thus ensuring a sufficient buffer zone against any further Turkish and German aggression against the Suez Canal. By this time, a new Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary took office. David Lloyd George and Lord Arthur Balfour replaced Asquith and Gray. Both came into power and both of them wanted to take the land of Israel. They wanted to make a big buffer zone to make sure that in the future no rival European power was ever going to come in and cut or thwart Britain's link from herself, from Britain, through to the Eastern Empire. The military campaign to capture Palestine from the Turks that continued through 1917 was beleaguered by one defeat after another. At home, 
the British government was considering the aspirations of the Zionist movement, which led to the Balfour Declaration. The Balfour Declaration is truly a defining moment of history. Why? Because a number of years earlier, the Zionist movement, which um, took off as a result of the initiatives of Herzl, first his very important document uh, under the name of the Jewish State, where he was looking for a solution to the Jewish problem. This document really is the beginning of the story. To understand the importance of the Balfour Declaration, we've got to go back to him. And his proposal, his solution was, we need to end the homelessness of the Jews. We need a home. We need a state. And then he had this conference in Basel, Switzerland in 1897 brought together 200 uh, prominent Jews from around the world and did something rather miraculous. He got them to unite. The history in Europe of what the Jewish people went through is horrendous. It is persecution, it is massacres, pogroms, expulsion from countries, it take, it take a long time to even summarize what the Jewish people went through. And there were leaders in Great Britain who were courageous and were prepared to make a decision which was a noble decision because it was time to act justly. It was time to repair these wrongs. When the British government with the help and support of the United States, of France, of Italy, decided that we're going to uphold and support this policy regarding the establishment of a Jewish national home in Palestine, everything changed. On the 31st of October 1917, as the War Cabinet met here in Whitehall, to decide the final wording of what became known as the Balfour Declaration. Unbeknown to them at that moment, the Allies won their first victory in the campaign to liberate Palestine from the Turks. Earlier that day, the British and New Zealand forces paved the way for the epic charge of the Australian Light Horse to take the historic town of Beersheba. It was one of the last horse-mounted charges in the history of warfare. The news of the victory in Bathsheba reached London on the day that the letter from Lord Balfour to Lord Rothschild was signed on the 2nd of November, 1917. His Majesty's government view with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done... The fall of Beersheba into Allied control paved the way for the conquest of Jerusalem and to bring the ancient Jewish homeland under British rule. A year later, on 31st of October 1918, the Turkish Ottoman Empire surrendered to the Allies. The surrender of the Germans and the Austro-Hungarian Empire followed shortly after that. After the end of World War I, in November 1918, a peace conference was convened in Paris in early 1919. The Balfour Declaration, which had the full support of the Allied powers, was a pledge to facilitate the formation of a Jewish national home in Palestine. However, at the time, it was merely a political statement with no legal authority. Contrary to popular belief today, the Balfour Declaration also had support from Arab leaders at the time. In January 1919, Heim Weizmann, the leader of the Zionist organization, met with one of the sons of Sharif Hussein, the Emir Faisal of the Arab Kingdom of Hejaz. They were looking for each other's support in respect to their national aspirations. Their discussions resulted in the signing of an agreement. 
which is often overlooked. And there are several provisions in this agreement, which was signed on January 3, 1919, which make it clear that Palestine is supposed to be the territory for the Jews. In fact, the third article of that agreement specifically mentions the policy of the Balfour Declaration in respect to Palestine. There is no doubt that the spirit and the letter of this agreement relates to a Jewish home in Palestine and a very significant independent Arab state in other parts of the Ottoman Empire. There you go. Uh, how many of you actually knew that uh, here was an agreement between the leader of the Zionist movement, Haim Weizmann, and also Faisal Hussein had an agreement in 1919 to work together for the establishment of the Jewish State of Israel and the establishment of one Arab state. And, and that's what I love about this documentary, Hugh, is that you bring out these gems in history that, that very few people actually realise, unless they are serious students of history, will understand that actually the Zionist movement and the Arabs, particularly under the leadership of uh, Amir Faisal Hussein, worked together to help establish the Jewish state of Israel. Indeed they did. and. Uh when they actually presented um, their submissions to the Paris Peace Conference the following month in February of 1919, first of all the Arabs and then three weeks later Chaim Weizmann and the, uh, and the Zionist organization, the territorial claims that they presented um, for submission to the Paris Peace Conference actually did not conflict with one another. And that is a virtually unknown fact of history. And as you say, they were working together for the common good of both peoples, the Arabs and the Jews. And it was only later with some of the radical Islamists like Haj Amin al-Husseini, um, who the British later uh, um, appointed Grand Mufti of Jerusalem that uh, things became undone. In fact, that appointment it, in itself probably did more to torpedo the mandate than anything else in those early days of the mandate. Yeah. And Hugh, I remember <coughs> reading a few years ago, reading this uh, incredible book that was written in the 19, late 1930s um, or mid-1930s uh, by a, a Dutch diplomat concerned about the rise of anti-Semitism in Europe, but also then he talks about the betrayal of the British government, the betrayal of the, uh, uh, the Balfour Declaration that was made between the British government and the Jewish people to help to uh, facilitate the establishment of a Jewish homeland in the area known as Palestine then, which was part of the mandates that were given by the League of Nations to prepare the Jewish people for statehood and what he said was was so striking in his book um, that he said that the the foreign office felt at the time this is talking about the early 1920s that if the jewish people succeeded in building their own state it would be a paradise state in which the arabs would want exactly the same thing and the british government would actually then lose control of uh, of palestine to the Jewish people. So therefore, from that moment on, the Foreign Office in particular started to work against um, the formation and the construction of a Jewish state in the British Mandate of Palestine. Um, why, why do you think it all went wrong? Because it started off so well. The signing of the Balfour Declaration, the incorporation of the Balfour Declaration into the San Marino Conference, and then became the key component, component of the... Uh, of the mandate that was given to the British uh, at the time to prepare the Jewish people's statehood. Where did it all go wrong? Well, it was, it was actually uh, about that time. As I said just now, yeah. Hajimin al-Husseini um, became the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. And he is what we would call today a radical Islamist. And um, I believe he was the great uncle of, of Yasser Arafat. Um, 
And so you had this um, Islamic, uh, radical Islamic thing to deal with. And in order to try and keep the peace, the British government really caved in to their demands and had a policy of appeasement. So there's, there is that aspect. Mm. But also, I believe there was growing anti-Semitism uh, in the British establishment as well. And certainly among some of the senior politicians. And what really was the turning point from a legal perspective was the white paper of 1939 and really that was an abrogation of the mandate, despite what the British government claimed. And um, there is absolutely no doubt that it was a major violation of the terms of the mandate. And as a result of that, hundreds of thousands of Jewish people who could have escaped from Nazi-occupied Europe, as it became, actually perished in the death camps of the Holocaust. So we do have blood on our hands. So th there you are a number... You could say millions there, couldn't you? One, you know. one um, Jewish historian said to me once, uh, on camera actually, in one of our films, that uh, she believed that it could be as many as two and a half million who could have escaped. But most certainly hundreds of thousands um, perished because of Britain's closed door on, on their ancient... Uh, homeland. Uh, wh why do you think that the, the British decided to uh, uh, appoint the um, Al Husseini as the uh, Grand Mufti, the supreme leader of, of the Arabs under the British mandate of Palestine, knowing that he was radicalised by um, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt um, and had an idea of f uh, and then using his position of power and influence to uh, incite hatred against the Jewish communities in the British Mandate of Palestine, despite the fact that it was through Jewish industry and technology that enabled so many of the Arabs to move into the British Mandate of Palestine from Syria and from Egypt and from Jordan to find work and give them employment. Well, I think it was a very serious uh, error of judgment, actually. Yeah. And so I think really what was behind that decision to make him Grand Mufti was that if they gave him some responsibility, uh, it would actually calm him down. It would, um, it would make him be a, a little bit more moderate. And in fact, it had the opposite effect. So it was a, it was a serious error of judgment. I don't think there was anything uh, of malicious intent uh, on behalf of the British in that appointment. And of course, they tried to appease him later on because they were frightened that uh, that the Arabs and Hajimin al-Husseini would side with the Nazis in the 1930s. And of course, that is actually what finished up happening. And you had um, Hajimin al-Husseini together with Hitler, 1942, they met. And um, what Hajimin wanted to see was the final solution actually extended right across the Middle East. And um, they started to they actually set up a, a Bosnian, um, uh, a, a Bosnian division, uh, who would come and um, execute yeah. that if ever it happened. But I believe God saved Israel at that time through the El Alamein campaign, and the Germans were actually defeated because they were going to take. That was their aim: was to take over Palestine. Let's have a, another look at uh, the an extract from the new documentary, Whose Land, produced by Hugh Kitson. One person who played a prominent role in the mandate was Winston Churchill. In 1921, he was appointed colonial secretary, which gave him the responsibility of implementing the mandate in the former Ottoman Empire. The 1922 white paper, which was attributed to Churchill, was in fact largely drafted by colonial office official John Shuckborough, together with the first High Commissioner to Palestine, Sir Herbert Samuel. It contained a phrase that was central to Churchill's belief that the Jews were in Palestine as of right and not by sufferance. They weren't tolerated for this. It wasn't a gift. 
it was their right to have the land. And unquestionably, by that point, Churchill believed it. I mean, he already was espousing Zionist views in 1906. He espoused them more strongly in 1908, but then when he went to Palestine in 1921 and saw everything that the Jews in Palestine were achieving uh, in uh, developing the land, and he felt them, they were also a moderating force and they shared his values. Uh, and on top of his belief from before that the Jews, as he put it later, made Jerusalem famous, uh, that this was their land from, from biblical times, was their promised land. From childhood onwards, Winston Churchill was a lifelong friend of the Jewish people, and especially Heim Weizmann. His father, Randolph Churchill, had been a friend of Britain's first Jewish Prime Minister, Benjamin Disraeli, which left a lifelong impression on Winston as a young man. British historian Andrew Roberts empathizes with Churchill's deep respect for the role of the Jewish people in Western civilization. I think as an historian, I would describe the role that the Jewish people have played for Western civilization in very much the same terms as Winston Churchill did in 1920. He said that the Jews have given us a system of ethics that is in um, effect the most um, important possession that Western civilization has. I'd very much go along with that. The uh, Judeo side of the Judeo-Christian tradition, obviously predating the uh, Christian tradition, is something that uh, we live by, and without the Jews we would not have. What he saw in Palestine in the early 20s convinced him that the Zionists were uh, partners with him in the advance of civilization. He was in no hurry to have a Jewish state in the 20s, he thought when the demographic balance was in the Jews' favor, then it should become a Jewish state. However, Winston Churchill, as colonial secretary in the early 1920s, is probably best remembered for the division of Palestine before the mandate was ratified. Following the Cairo Peace Conference of March 1921, Churchill was under pressure to fulfill the aspirations of Amir Faisal and his brother Abdullah. As a result, he drew a line down the Jordan River and 77% of Palestine was designated for Arab settlement exclusively. In 1921, Faisal, which was Hussein's son, who was supposed to get Syria, was having a lot of friction with the French uh, who had the mandate of Syria. Churchill uh, agreed to, based on recommendations by his staff, was to give Abdullah to rule over what is today Jordan. Chaim Weizmann was very angry about it that Churchill made this decision without consulting him or any other Zionist leaders. The decision was made by the British in 1921 at a time when they had no right by themselves to do this. But it was subsequently endorsed and adopted in 1922 by the Council of the League of Nations. An Arab state was also created and established within the boundaries of what was described as Palestine. So in this day and age, when we talk about the establishment of a Palestinian state in what is referred to as the West Bank, it's really the creation of an Arab state. Palestinians are Arabs. This would be, in fact, the creation of a second Arab state since one was created in 1922. And there we are, the uh, incredible role played by the late uh, Sir Winston Churchill, uh, known as the saviour of Britain during World War II. Uh, what I found incredible, I think, uh, I think it's fair to say, Hugh, that that is the gem within your new documentary, Whose Land? Um, because we see through the excellent narration done by their Colonel Richard Kemp talking about the role Winston Churchill played and the fact that he supported Jewish self-determination all his life. He was a big fan of the Jewish people. Um, is maybe why the Lord raised him up to become Prime Minister during our, those very, very dark years during World War II. Um, 
Can you tell us something more about Winston Churchill and, and why he decided to support the Zionists um, and uh, enable to help them return to their ancient covenant homeland, despite the fact when he was colonial secretary in 1921, of given 77% of the British mandate to the Arabs? Um, well, I think, I think really uh, uh, Andrew Roberts summed it up very well. Um, it, it, that he saw that the Jewish people had actually um, contributed so much to Western civilization, and I believe that uh, that was at the heart of it. But um, the documentary also goes on a little bit more about Winston Churchill, and we were talking about the 1939 white paper just now, uh, before that, and Winston Churchill vociferously attacked the, um, the 1939 White Paper. His own party, the Conservative Party, was in power, and he went absolutely against them. And he gave a very rousing speech in Parliament condemning the White Paper. And um, even though he became uh, Prime Minister a year later, uh, there was not much he could do to actually reverse it. But he always had in the back of his mind the idea that one day there would be a Jewish state. And um, the book that's written by Michael Mikofsky, who you saw there, uh, Churchill's Promised Land, is a very good read indeed. And basically he was pro-Zionist all his life, except that he did have one or two lapses, as, <laughs> as politicians do. Um, but uh, he, he was always a, a, um, a fierce proponent of, of Zionism until one incident in um, November 1944, the assassination of Lord Moyne. Now, that didn't turn him against Zionism, but he, he basically gave up the fight, if you like. And, you know, for the next four years or so, he was completely silent. He didn't communicate with Chaim Weizmann, who was a very close friend of his. When Israel became a state in 1948, he was silent. And I, I think he was, in a, he was in a state of mourning, in one sense. And then something happened uh, in November of 1948. And by the way, Britain did not even recognize Israel as a sovereign state back in May 1948. Um, in the latter part of the mandate, Britain did everything she could to obstruct the emergence of a Jewish state in those latter years of the mandate. And so when uh, David Ben-Gurion declared the state of Israel, and by the way, this is where part one finishes, and we'll take part two of whose land up from there. Hopefully it'll be out next year. That's a little plug. Um, but Churchill got up, and I don't know what um, caused this to happen, in November 1948, and he made the most passionate pro-Zionist speech he ever made in Parliament. And as a result of that, the British government recognised the state of Israel. Amazing. Hugh, we're, we're down to the last uh, two minutes so of the programme. Um, can you tell us, our viewers, why they need to watch your new film, Whose Land? And, and what will it do for our Christian viewers to have a deeper historical and legal understanding for the foundations of the modern state of Israel? Well, um, you know, when we did a, a screening tour in Australia back in August, um, s someone said to me, aren't you preaching to the choir? And yes, we do want to get a wider audience for sure, and especially political leaders. Um, but I answered that question by asking another question. <laughs> did you learn anything from watching this film? And just about everyone did. So one needs to, if you like, arm the choir so that they can stand up for Israel. I think that is very important indeed. So uh, there are gems of history in here, which I learned about as we were making the film. Fantastic. Uh, Hugh Kitson, I want to thank you so much for being uh, my guest on today's uh, Middle East Report and uh, I look forward to the second film coming out. Also look forward to a future prog programme with uh, you and uh, Colonel Richard Kemp as well. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Simon. And I just want to thank you for watching today's uh, Middle East Report. It's important that we gain a historical 
and also a legal understanding of how the modern Jewish state of Israel came about. And uh, I can't think of a better way than to watch this film, a uh, huge new film called Whose Land, to actually tell you that and inform that. Because it's important that we have an understanding of history if we are going to proclaim the truth about God's plans and purposes for Israel and the Jewish people. So thank you so much for watching today's Middle East Report. Yeah.